What's up, dudes? Welcome back to another episode of Ramas Men's Team. Uh, pretty simple. We are a group of guys helping each other make progress towards each other's goals. If you're new to the channel, awesome and welcome. If you want to help support the channel and join our pro team, head over to ramasteam.com pro, where you can contribute to us on a donation basis. We also give you access to exclusive content, mastermind groups, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, hope you enjoy this episode and we'll see you on the team. What's up, dudes? Another episode of Ramas Men's Team. Mr. Ray, Mr. Rob, what's going on, dudes? Hey, how's it going? So uh, last week we were talking about breaking down Brene Brown's trust uh, uh, acronym. And we started hitting on the edge of that conversation about cheating on your spouse, your girlfriend, etc. Um, so I think that's a conversation worth having because it's a very interesting dynamic. You know, it's, I've noticed that men have sort of like a uni dimensional or let's say, yeah, a uni, di, di, unidirectional opinion on this. I'm massively generalizing. Um, Rob, what is your opinion on cheating, uh, whether being cheated on and or men cheating on their significant others? Ooh, that's a, that's a tricky one. I feel like that's a slippery yeah. slope. Yeah. Big time. Um, I mean, I, I've seen people give up on their relationships where like it's both male and female and it's a partner seeking intimacy just through any means necessary. And that leads to cheating. And it's, to me, feels a little bit less nefarious than, you know, chasing an urge and doing something, um, you know, hedonistic. But I can never condone it because I feel like there's just too much on the line for if you're in a committed relationship, you should be committed. I feel like if you take that stance of like, hey, I'm going to be committed to you, you're going to be committed to me. Nothing should get in that way. But as I've gotten older, I start I have started to see in certain circumstances where it's like, dang, I kind of understand as to why that happened, even though I don't condone it. Yeah, and this is why it's an interesting topic. And by the way, if any anybody listening wants to hop on, just raise your hand um, on the Crowdcast app, and then we can bring you guys on. Uh, I know this is a pretty heated topic, so I don't want to put any of you on the spot. Um, also, I'll invite a few of you up here uh, throughout the discussion. Don't feel <laughs> obligated uh, like you uh, have to come on here. So let's uh, let's dissect this, because I think in a weird way, it's very easy to rationalize cheating especially for a male because the stereotypical narrative is you know hey guys are meant to plant their seed it's just biology bro you know that sort of thing um so i'm curious what you guys think about that and phil hey i'm so sorry i just accidentally kicked you off would you mind uh, i'll invite you back up you had double double video up so anyway like on one side of the fence if i were to ask my buddies hey how would you feel if you got cheated on? I mean, they'd probably bring up murder, you know? Uh, but then when I ask him, it's like, well, how do you feel about cheating on someone? Well, it's like, well, it's biology, man. You know, like they wouldn't say it just like that, but that's the general gist. Rob, do you find that that's a similar pattern that you've noticed with men? Oh, for sure. I mean, there's, and there's truth to it. So it's not that I'm... Uh, it's just so tricky because I don't want to say anything that's ever going to incriminate myself. But the reality is I do think that I was watching a podcast the other day with Tom Sakura and his wife and they had a guest on and the guest said, if you could offer a guy the opportunity to have sex with any girl he wanted and it meant nothing to him, but his wife was okay with it. He, they were saying a hundred percent of guys would take that up. And I think that that is true because I think there is a biological aspect to it. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that's enough reason to participate, obviously. I mean, there's a lot of urges we have. Like I have the urge to – people have the urge to drink alcohol every day. It doesn't mean you should. You know, like we all have urges that I feel like we have to, you know, keep at bay. But absolutely, biologically, I think that that's probably right. Well, let me ask you this. So that's your perspective on that side of the fence. Let's say the same 
opportunity or offer was given to, let's say your, your spouse. Yeah. You know? That's, that's why it's a huge double standard. Yeah. I mean, there'd be, there'd be very few occasions if my wife cheated on me that I would take her back. Like if I felt true <laughs> yeah. resentment or regret or like a mistake, I would potentially, especially if I loved her a lot and like she gave into her urges because I mean, I do think that there's a common misconception that girls have urges too. like girls are also sexually ambitious, like they have those same things. But for them, it's just they're better at controlling that urge. That's how I feel. Ray, what's your perspective? Well, I, um, I was trying to figure out the way to phrase my thought from last week. And Patty P in the comments put it perfectly. He wrote, Relation, a relationship is like anything else. You have to maintain it for it to exist. And so um, what that means to me is that um, you can go into a relationship with a zero tolerance for infidelity. Uh, but then that requires you. OK, so that's the th that might be those might be your rights, but those rights require duties in exchange for nourishing that relationship. Um, otherwise, um, infidelity may occur. And I don't want you to confuse that with uh, a blank check for infidelity that I would give to somebody or, or give or provide for myself. You know, I just think that um, in the absence of nurturing the relationship, uh, like if you, if you don't nurture a healthy relationship, I don't know how you can demand zero tolerance on it, it, for, for infidelity. Is there a world in which you nurture a relationship and also has room for like the spouse exploring physically outside of the relationship? Yeah. I mean, there, there are some people who would be okay with that. Um, I'm okay with that. Like it, it, it would be a case by case basis. It would absolutely be a case by case basis. But I mean, there are as many different kinds of marriage out of the, as there are people, Wes. So, yeah, there is a scenario where that's possible. That might not be okay for you. That might not be okay for me. But um, if it's okay for somebody out there and they can talk about it in advance with their partner, exactly, Patty. Then, uh, yeah, that, that that we don't need to judge that person or. Um, they can navigate that any way they want. Phil, how would you like to navigate that? Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess yeah, the idea of like um, even like polyamory is pretty just like unthinkable to me because to me it's just like yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm just uh, not into that kind of thing to the to the ridiculous degree that I kind of feel like. I know this is probably false, but I feel like no one is, no one should be doing that. And people that are, are, are um, hurting themselves to some degree. And then maybe that's a complete, very ignorant thing. I don't know, whatever. That's just my belief. I know it's probably just based on the fact that I don't like it so much, but uh, I don't necessarily know that I'm right about that. But yeah, I don't think, I don't know. I don't think polyamory makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons, biologically. I just think yeah, we're... Yeah. we're like, like, it's like you're saying, actually, it's interesting what you're saying, because I kind of feel the same way. It's very, well, I feel the same way about a lot of things, but it's very easy to be like, um, very, very judgmental of your spouse and not be, even if you're completely not reciprocating. And it's a very easy thing to fall into, I feel like. Um, mm -hmm. But just on, on, on tons of stuff, not, not just on cheating, you know, it's very easy to be hypocritical like that with a, with a relationship in particular. Yeah, it's it's very fascinating. I mean, because Rob, if you don't mind, like when I dissect, let's say the vibe I was picking up from your answer, and also saying that I'm not saying that that's what you agree with. Um, it's so interesting, because on one side, men as men, we typically say what you said, like, hey, man, this is just, it's just the how the universe made us. If my wife ever did it, there's about zero circumstances where I would not just re completely remove her from my life. Do you know what I mean? It's a it's a very like lopsided um, situation. And, and because I, I don't think it's too hard to rationalize it, but it's just very interesting to me when I, like I, 
I could rationalize it in my head. But then as soon as somebody questions me and says, well, how would you feel if it was done on the other side? I'm like, no fucking way. You know, it's very, it's a very interesting pattern. Um, I, I also don't know that I've ever seen a successful, you know, what else do they call it? Like, uh, not just polyamory. Um, what do they call relationship? it? Yeah. I've, I've, I've literally, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I'm saying I have never seen a successful open relationship. There's, there's guys- two things. There's two things that play though, because I feel like from the perspective of like mating and bonding and like wanting to be with one person, hundred percent. But then I also feel like sexuality can be its own conversation in its own right. Like do people sexuality vary so much. And like sexual chemistry is a thing. So like, so I've seen people make it work because they maybe didn't have the best compatibility, but they had terms and agreements. I've seen it work, but it's rare. Yeah. Ray, have you ever I can, seen it? I can totally understand that. Yeah, I can. I can sorry, I was just going to say, I can understand that just because I can, I can understand. I don't feel this way, but I can understand people. Some people feel that like. Um, they just, and they just really enjoy sex. It's kind of like a hobby to them and they, they want to, you know, do that with a bunch of people. That's great. Um, to me, the relationship and the, and sex go together very, uh, they're not, not really separable to me. So that's, I think part of why I see polyamory is like, uh, like why I kind of look down on it, which maybe is just ignorant of me, but you know. Yeah. It's like Ray said, case by case, but I do think 95% yeah. of the time it's not going to work unless you have a really strong relationship with that person and you're both on the same page about your individual sexuality. Well, okay. So let's establish some, some biomarkers for success. So have you guys ever seen a successful open relationship? Let's say that has lasted more than, I don't know. What do you guys think? Three years and, and, they are happy to the point where you would want to replicate it. Does that make sense? Because we have to establish some sort of, right, like boundary. Uh, Ray, have you, number one, would you want to change that success biomarker? And and if not, then have you seen it work long term? Uh, I've tried it and it, it hasn't worked, um, Mike, and I've seen it in others and it hasn't worked. That's not to say that it should be outlawed or discouraged um but uh, people should be realistic about the chances if they choose to enter into one of these arrangements uh when i started entering into one or, or some version of that um someone cautioned me that they tried it too and what they found was the things that made them unhappy in their original relationship still made them unhappy in the novel relationship, which led them to believe that there was personal work that they had to do. There was an unhappiness in them that was not going to be solved by just replacing the partner or adding a partner. Mm. And yeah, I, mean, that's I have found like... that to be true as well. Um, the things that drive me crazy about one woman drive me crazy it, like make me in you know make, <laughs> like drive me crazy in a bad way yeah no. um in a, in a, in in the other woman and i've come to believe that they if i added a third the same things would likely drive me crazy therefore there is an internal um house cleaning or inventorying or um growth that needs to take place um that is not going to be solved with an open marriage or multiple partners or infidelity yeah patty p is saying you know harder work on the actual problems than you know than it is to stick your parts in new parts uh right. found wisdom from patty p it's sincerely you know like i the the ability for a human being to distract themselves with an with what seems like an easier opportunity rather than actually work on the problems. I mean, it's just always amazing to me. And by the way, I'm in that camp, you know, just, it's just psychology. Um, I have not seen open relationships work. And if I had to dissect it just kind of like in real time, 
it seems like it always comes down to exactly what I or you guys would think it would come down to. Like there are some sort of stipulations put out of the gate, like kind of like Ray, where you were saying, like, hey, as long as you know it's on a case by case basis. Well, now, now you have to revisit the decision every single time until somebody doesn't bring it up. Well, now, hey, that case, why didn't you tell me about that case? And now I found out about that case. Do you know what I mean? It just seems like it creates this 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 dysfunction. Um and it comes down to trust, I feel like. So every time I've seen it break, it feels like it came back to somebody violated these rules. And it almost seemed like the rule book was like leveraged against them to begin with. Uh, Rob, have you found something similar? Hey dudes, sorry for the interruption here. Just wanted to let you know, if you wanna join our pro team, go to romasteam.com slash pro. You can help support the channel. You will also get access to exclusive content masterminds, one-on-one sessions, et cetera. All right, back to the episode. It's just so multifactorial. Like for instance, I've known several couples and uh, a lot of times children come into play where it's like, hey, we want to have kids. We want to stop this. One person does, one person doesn't. Mm -hmm. Or someone's okay with it, but then they forget that girls can walk down the street and find a partner and a guy has to like literally shoot his shot 155 times because number one, it's harder to find a willing female participant, let alone one that knows you're in a relationship. So it's, and I also feel like what you guys have said, if it's like a way to fix a foundational relationship issue versus just having a physiological issue to be met, I think that a lot of people get into it for the wrong reason. So I really think the only way it works is if both people are truly okay, very comfortable in their sexuality. Maybe there's a sexual compatibility issue. Maybe it's not working with each other, but there's so much love. Like, for instance, let me ask you this, Wes. If you love someone to the moon and back and they were perfect, but you didn't have the best sexual chemistry, and that was one of life's best gifts is that experience of having sex, would you consider it or would you have a different take on it? Yeah, it's a really good question. I'm trying to give, like, think it through. Um, I don't know that it would be possible for me to, like, put it even in that compartment of my brain. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know that that particular person would be put in the, the, like, attractive compartment for me just as a partner, not not only physically, but for some reason to me, I can't, maybe my brain can't divorce one from the other. Mm. Right. It, 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 it's almost like like if I'm not if I wouldn't be attracted to a girl, it, it I, I would look at them as you. Do you know what I mean? But like, does that make sense? Like there would be no differentiation. Uh, it's again, not that they're not attractive. What if what if there's just component issues? Like what if there just isn't the right situation with puzzle pieces, we, you know, like there, yeah, that, you that, and I would that, have component issues. Um, so, <laughs> exactly. You know, like that's. But that's almost the th at least for me. I'm trying to answer honestly. Like I think it would be put in that category. Like it would just that would be a friend. I, I, it would never get past. I don't think, right the, the the line in the sand that says, "Oh, this is an this is a, this is an applicant for lack of better terminology." So sexual chemistry is an absolute required checkbox. If it's not checked, it's all done. Yeah, you know, I'm not trying to sound like a pig. I'm just trying to be honest. Like I, I <laughs> no, no, I'm curious. Don't, yeah, I don't think my brain would ever do the calculus on it. it. It's like, I don't know, it's hard dissecting this stuff, but it's, it's again, it'd be no different than me talking to you. Like it would, ne it would never be a consideration, but go oh, just because our, you know, our parts don't work together, right? Like there was, it's, it just never, you know, it, it never crosses my mind. Um, I mean, Ray or, or Phil, what's your perspective on that? Like, has that pattern existed with you guys? Well, I think the challenge is that, um, in the scenario, my problem with the scenario Rob proposed is that he was asking you, what if nine out of 10 factors were met, but that one wasn't? Uh, you didn't, Rob, you didn't. Um, I, I think that that um, scenario is too simple because there's also his female partner, right? And, and, and um, we're assuming that 10 out of 10 factors are being satisfied for her, right? Because in my personal experience, let, let me explain maybe a little better with an example. Um, 
in an example close to home, one person wasn't sexually satisfied or wasn't felt um, like they were being romanced enough. And the other partner wasn't feeling accepted or loved or like they were good enough, right? So when they open up the marriage and one finds that sexual gratification and that being wined and dined, um, that narrow lane is improved. But when, but um, the other partner goes out and finds acceptance and love. Mm. The person who wanted to remedy just the sex will not like that the love and acceptance is being sought outside the marriage. The point I'm trying to make, I guess, or it, it, I, I don't know how to phrase it really poetically, but like um, in my experience, when a marriage is opened up, that's because one or both people are not getting what they need out of the relationship. Right. And uh, I don't think that's it, true though. Emotionally per se, it might be physically true. I mean, like if you're doing it for emotional needs, like we've established, if you're trying to seek like a foundational emotional connected connection issue out of the marriage, then that relationship is just done. Yes. Mm. Agreed. But if it's a physical need, I'm, that's where I'm curious. And by the way, I, I don't know where I stand on this. I just know that I've been in a relationship where it's like, God, damn it, this person's perfect, but we don't have the best intimacy. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, um, do you have more to say, Ray? I don't want to cut you off. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I was just going to, thank you, Phil. I was just going to say that, you know, uh, um, Rob, uh, and those emotional needs might be bedrock emotional needs, therefore the relationship's done. But to someone else, Maybe the intimacy and sexual like compatibility is a bedrock need. And if that's mm -hmm. not met, the relationship is done. Um, mm -hmm. So marinate on that. Phil, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm just kind of, I don't know, questioning myself a little bit. Like, you know, it's, I don't know if you guys uh, hear this or feel this way, but I feel like a lot in America um, right now, there's this feeling that, um, stronger than ever that like we've lost our way in terms of values and we don't have Christian values anymore. And I'm not, I've never been Christian, but um, you know, a lot of people feel that this Amer America was, was great largely in part because of Christian values. And it's interesting to me that I feel like almost all Christian values are gone from society except for sex. Somehow sex Protestant or I don't know, Christian values regarding sex are very deeply ingrained in America. Like, um, the idea of monogamy and the idea of, you know, commitment and that divorce is a, a horrible thing you shouldn't do is still, I mean, maybe divorce isn't considered completely horrible by everyone. And not all these things are considered horrible by everyone, but they're still like very strongly, like emotionally believed, like regardless of, logic they're like emotionally believe very deeply i feel like a lot of these values and it's kind of interesting i don't know it's just kind of a weird it's just sort of inexplicable i guess to me in a way that like so many of our other values are kind of gone like um a lot of christian like community and like you know moral guidance type of stuff doesn't really happen much more in society often like even like judging people even in like in ways that are completely constructive. Like a, a friend of mine said he was at Costco recently and he said, saw some kid with his mom and his kid was standing up on top of the table. And for some reason, like he said, just the old man in him like snapped and he started yelling at this kid. He's like, get off the table. Like people eat on the table. You don't put your shoes on the table, like get off. And like, and the mom got really pissed at him was like, don't tell my kid. It was like, he was like, well then you should be a parent. Um, and it's crazy how that's like unthinkable these days. That's like something like crazy to do. But um, I've got a block right here. Random, random side fact from yeah. Phil. It is kind of weird. Like if my mom told me an adult, if my mom was told by an adult I was doing something wrong, there was a 100% chance she would punish me. And like the other day, I saw someone poking holes in the meat at Costco. And I mentioned to I mentioned to him like, hey, buddy, you should probably stop doing that. And then I told his mom and she's like, my son wouldn't do that. And I was like, dude, my mom would whip yeah. me <laughs> if a stranger like, told her she was poking hole. I was poking holes. But I get what you're saying. 
and and it's just it's strange to me i don't understand exactly what caused that you know because it really does seem like we have lost a lot of values in america but not we've at least lost the enforcement of values um in a lot of ways and we we haven't necessarily with sex at least like it's very deep you know like like i i a friend of mine took me to this movie i literally walked out of the end of it um called crimes of the future it's a it's a gore movie and i i can't stand gore and i didn't know that coming into it i didn't know it was a gory gory movie and i just i can't deal with violence in movies or extreme violence and it was so disgusting it was like they're like close-up shots of people being cut open it's like slow mo it's like it was disgusting it was, i don't know people are into gore i guess they'd love it but I couldn't. Yeah, stand, if, so if there's one actually, type of genre to know that you're going to go and see that genre, that would that would be it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Seriously. I think, yeah. My friend did it on purpose to fuck with me. I think, but um, but like, I was just thinking like after I after I was waiting for the movie to end, uh, sitting standing by myself outside, um, I was just thinking like it is so crazy in this country that if you show pubic hair, it's instantly pornography. It's adults only. You can't put it in any theater anywhere. You cannot sh- like you can't get anywhere in your sex, but you can show someone being cut open for literally the entire movie. Like that's fine, and you can put that in every movie theater. Like that's I don't know that's crazy, and it's just you know I, I don't know that's, I don't really have a point. It's just it's weird that America is so touchy about sex and like seems to not care about anything else, <laughs> but like at all because like that's our sole purpose in life, Phil. Like literally, if you like not to be. A Debbie Downer, but our sole purpose in life is to reproduce. Maybe I don't know. Other cultures are different, though. You know, Europe is very serious about violence and doesn't really care that much about sex compared to America uh, in terms of entertainment. They, Wes, they're like, what do you kind of think of this they, issue? What do you think of this point? I think it's a very interesting point that Phil raises. Is that like, um, why does America have such a puritanical attitude towards sex? Um, when all the other values that used to be bundled with it seem to have, whether you'd call it diluted or evolved, is up to you. Um, and do you and are do you have and 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 the, and Wes, do you also have puritanical ideas when it comes to sex? Well, I I really like the concept that Phil brought up, which is okay. Uh, is there a certain percentage of the population that is dismissive of old school traditional values because maybe they were tr- historically biblical in nature? And it's like, I mean, Phil, maybe you can relate to this, but, you know, when somebody says, well, hey, don't do that. And it's, well, because I said so or because God said so or whatever. So, like, I look at my peers and I basically think that none of them believe what their parents believe in terms of their religion. Now, they might believe a a derivative of it, but it's a small breadcrumb of what their parents believe. Um, So I wonder, though, with that degrading in in a belief system, like a doctrine, that if there's a simultaneous degrading in the value infrastructure, because to be quite honest, I I feel like as I look at the scaffolding in my knowledge of value structures, there's gaps there that are just taken up by like, well, that's because God said so. And then it's like, well, once you start getting educated and Phil, I feel like you'd probably be in this camp. Well, once you start getting educated, and if you're particularly curious and then you start looking into it, it's like, well, wait a second. Well, the Bible also said, I think what Sam Harris teaches is like there's a section in the Bible that says, well, you should. If you're, if you're, if your wife, you find out your wife is not a virgin on your wedding night, then you should take her to your father's door, her father's doorstep and murder her, you know, something like that. So then it's like, well, obviously we shouldn't do that. So it's like, well, okay, well, what other parts of the doctrine should we not do? So it starts to degrade the fabric of something that was supposed to be sacred. But then even, and which I, by the way, like, I believe that is a valid, like anything should be able to be deconstructed for its rational component parts. Well, but if you don't fill that back in with something, right, yeah. that that reestablishes the foundation, well, then you might sign up for more dysfunction than if you just would have kept it in there. Rob, I feel like you are equally as curious. Like, what, what's your perspective on that? Are, are we having to degra- degrade some of these things because we're not filling back in the foundation? 
Dude, there's, I could give you so many anecdotal stories on this, but I think that there's a, I generally believe Judeo-Christian values are good, but there's a huge gap in a lot of the things that they teach. You know, I mean, I'm sure we've all heard of the Catholic schoolgirl syndrome, right? They're just under the thumb of their, you know, their parents for so long, or like the doctrine of their, of their religion. And the second they have no um, authoritative figure, they go off to college, they lose it because they've been oppressed for so long. And it's like not a healthy way to cope with it. Or, you know, people that are religious that do have these natural urges that participate in it and then have this terrible sensation of like being stigmatized or like, you know, I had a Christian girlfriend and like, you know, we would, she would have the natural curiosity and desires. And then like we'd, we'd participate and then she'd be mad at me or be upset or she would even cry sometimes. And I'm like, this is just, isn't healthy. And like, it makes me realize there is no alternative. Like, I don't, I don't know, Wes. I mean, that's a good point. I don't think anybody really does. Yeah. Is that what you were alluding to? Yeah, because exactly. Because I wonder if this particular topic that we're, we're pinpointing today is an example of that, right? Like there's a difference between saying, Hey, don't cheat on your spouse because your doctrine said so. And then when you do it and you don't get struck by lightning, you're like, oh, well, maybe the doctrine wasn't right. Right. Versus, hey, don't cheat on your spouse or your girlfriend because that's what you agreed to. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you gave your word to somebody and they are now building their future off of your agreement. And you would not want the reciprocal, right? You giving your word to somebody and them giving your word to you. So you build off of that. And then all of a sudden she comes home and says, oh, by the way, I've been dating Rick, the neighbor, right? (laughs) Boom. Just like Jordan Peterson says, not only does that ruin your present, it ruins your future, obviously. And it also ruins your past because you are with somebody that you thought you knew. So now your brain goes back and I didn't know them at all. Phil, what's your, what's your perspective? Yeah, I think, um, I'm just losing my train of thought a little bit, but I think um, how could you not with with Wes ranting like like fucking Fidel Castro over there? Wes, <laughs> what the hell? Can you rephrase the question in like ten words or less, please? Yeah. So, do we need if you don't subscribe? Oh, okay. Yeah. Let's say the biblical yeah. norm. Is it more about now pegging where your if, agreement is and staying true to that? Well, look. So the thing is, like, I I really believe like. Actually, uh, for kind of a stupid reason, but um, I think that this this problem of of generational transfer of knowledge is possibly the hardest, possibly the hardest problem humans have to solve. Mm. It's in, unbelievably difficult. Like, okay, uh, I'll just say this very briefly, hopefully. But there's this really one of my one of my favorite game designers ever made the, made a game about this uh, a couple of years ago, and it's the most incredible. It's in my opinion, like the newest and coolest game ever, even though it's a very simple thing, but it, what it is, it's an MMO, it's an online game where everyone's playing in the same world together. And you're born as a baby, as literally as a baby to another player who's your mother. And you live w- for one hour. Every, every minute is one year of your life. So you grow up a year every minute and then you die, everyone dies at the age of 60. And so the point is of the game, the point of the game is you're born, you do stuff for an hour, which is a very short amount of time, and then you're dead, and then you're born somewhere else, and the world is so large, it's it's about the same size as Earth. So you don't ever, you're never born in the same place. So you're trying to build society is the same way real humans are, where everyone comes into the world knowing nothing. No one, they don't have any relationships with anyone other than my mother, if she cares to care about me. And then we do stuff, and then we die, and all the knowledge that's in my head that I didn't put in the world somewhere is gone. Cause I'm gone. So how do we build society? And it's the, the game is, has this incredibly complicated um, tech tree where if you want to build a furnace, you need clay and you need to, if you want to get clay, you have to do all this stuff. So it's like this insane uh, reverse tree tree going upwards where it's like, you can build cars in the game, but to build cars, you need metal and to build metal, you need all this other stuff. And it's like, do all that stuff. You can't, you need, you need an industry of people just like in real life. It's like, you need to, so it's like when, when we're when we're questioning things, we are tearing down walls. You know the saying, "Don't tear, don't remove a fence until you know who put it up." Right? Like that's what you are doing when you question something, when you question the Bible, 
or when you question anything that is p- a part of the glue that holds society together. And no one <laughs> at all, I, I don't think, knows what the answer is to like, how do you do that without, how do you do that in a constructive way? Like it's not, it's extremely, it's, 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 extre- it's probably the hardest problem we have, we could ever try to solve, you know, societally. Um, I think definitely, you know, you can try to be productive and you can try to leave behind as productive of a past as you can, but you never know how people are going to even engage with what you leave behind, you know? I don't know. Um, seems unbelievably difficult. That's all I really have to say. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I guess, I guess I would say also just that I do think there's a, even though I don't think that religion has the right, I don't think that Christianity has all the right answers. I don't, I, I think there's a big problem with uh, questioning its values because it, I think people over overplay how much Christianity created, why everything is good right now. I think people give Christianity a little bit too much credit for that, but I don't think it's zero credit. Obviously it's, it's something. And so if we don't have that anymore, which we kind of don't, what's going to happen, you know, what's going to happen to society? No one can No, one, It's like, <clears throat> Christianity is like gravity in a sense. It pulls people together and without, you can't just create gravitational forces like that, right? Like you can create something that's very good. I think this is the challenge of it. You can create something that's very, very good. And what you can create a framework, like maybe ACT, like the thing Matt talks about, but you can't make people come to that framework for some reason, for whatever reasons, Christianity not only was a good framework, but it had this gravity that pulled people into it. Like, a ridiculous degree. You know, maybe some of that was circumstance or maybe some of that was design. We don't really know what caused it to become as big, big as it is, but creating that force of gravity, social gravity is, is just like impossible. No one can plan that, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, so I'll stop right here. <laughs> no, no, this is, this is great because again, getting back to our topic, it's like we're, we're hitting on one of the cornerstones of, society. I mean, I think there's a very strong argument to say, okay, well, the family is the nucleus of, of communities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if for some reason you don't believe in that, which is okay, but are you actually doing the work to deconstruct it, to come up with your own reconstructed value system? And it's kind of like Jordan Peterson says, just like, be careful before you start to like solve the world's problems when you haven't really acted in the world yet. You know, if, if you're 20 years old thinking that you can totally reconstruct, you know, and re-knit the fabric of society, like you're saying, Phil, you might want to think twice about that because you might le- bring a level of chaos on your life that you're not willing to welcome. Now, at the same time, if, you know, you listen to somebody like Sam Harris, which if you guys have not, just he's got excellent debates with Jordan Peterson, um, with, uh, with a few other guys like in the religious world. And I think it's really good, thoughtful discussions that you guys might be interested in. I mean, these are, you know two, three, four, five hours long debates on this particular topic. But to get back to the origin of what we're talking about, you know, can it be as simple as rationally going through and making agreements with your partner and then sticking to those agreements? So that way, if she has a different religious view than you do, that you guys can create your own doctrine and that will be the standard by which you are held accountable for. Ray, what's your thought on that? Um, I love the idea of agreements, Wes. I think like um, that was, I mean, that really ties in well with my argument at the beginning of this conversation where, you know, um, if you're going to demand 100% fidelity, well, that comes along with a lot of obligations. Um, not in a bad way, but just a lot of responsibilities, right? To nurture and maintain that relationship, and so that would be uh, that would be that could be created in those kind of agreements, right? right? And um, yeah. and I wonder what uh, since since you have an encyclopedic knowledge of the um, the Gottman um, method and the and um, Mr. and Mrs. Gottman's. Uh, uh, approach to relationships. I wonder what they would think 
about a zero tolerance to um, infidelity and a oh, oh, and also I wonder what they would think about the idea of monogamy and polygamy. So, um, yeah, those are my thoughts. Yeah. Well, if you if you combine the text, which I think is a really good place to start, if you seven principles for making marriage work by John Gottman, who became famous in like the psychology world because he was able to predict divorce inside of like a 15 minute conversation with like 85 percent accuracy, something along those lines. But then if you combine his text with with uh, Esther, Esther Perel's text of mating in captivity, and she also did a TED talk about, hey, do we need to re-question this idea of man and woman become one in a relationship, right? If we look historically, you know, um, even a marriage was, you were baked inside of a community, inside of a tribe. So you were able to get these needs met outside of the marriage in a very normalized, social normally normal way. But now as we strive more towards independence, hey, you're just in a big house, you and your spouse together, and you're expecting your spouse to meet all of your 25 needs. Well, how is that going to work functionally, number one? But then number two, her position is what creates attraction is polarity. So if now this idea of you becoming one with somebody and they're your only source to get your needs met, well, are you going to lose attraction? So it's a really, those two texts I think are really important to, to, for everybody to read. Um, Arjuna, you, you mentioned something in the chat. Um, you know, let's put that on the table. Oh yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. I was mentioning, uh, Friedrich, Friedrich Nietzsche, the guy who, uh, kind of created nihilism. He had this whole thing about the Ubermensch and, uh, it got kind of a bad rep because Hitler kind of took it over. And, you know, and so <laughs> societally, a lot of people use it. It's connected to that. So it's a lot of people. Mm can't discern the difference. But the whole notion being like, uh, kind of finding, uh, going against the societal norm. Like I, I look at it as like when I fell in love with parkour, it's like parkour is kind of climbing on things, doing things that are, you're not walking on the sidewalk. And I think when you're doing something like that, you're kind of creating your own set of ideology, of, of morality, of ethics, of character. Like we're all so kind of conformed into what we're supposed to do. But then when you start kind of changing those neural pathways of creating your own sense of empowerment, then you realize kind of how bullshit everything is. And but not really in a negative way, because you are forging your own path. And so the whole idea being like it's Ubermensch is like Superman. So it's the person who's living their own life. And, and realistically, that's that's all inventors, that's all artists, that's everyone who's kind of made a name for themselves and who have, along the way in the history of human uh, of society. And uh, I mean, we were talking on that earlier, so I just wanted yeah, well, to. I, I'm, I'm curious about that because what comes up for me, and again, relating to this topic, is like on one side of the fence, if we just collapse everything, well, then... I don't think it takes too much to too much logic to understand how that could be completely dysfunctional, you know, of like, well, I'm just going to I'm going to walk around naked or I'm going to do whatever I want. You'll find out within 15 seconds of walking out into the community that other humans don't like it. And as, as soon as soon as that happens, as soon as other people are not willing to play the same game, you're going to have a really tough time getting through life. So I wonder if there's a Venn diagram there of like, okay, you have old school, hardcore tradition on the right side and then complete, you know, freedom on the other side. I wonder if there's a middle ground of like, hey, maybe there's some space here to prune the trees a little bit. That would give us a really good benefit. Phil, what's your perspective? Um, Well, look, I mean, it's I think it's, it's very clear to me that morality is a is a contract that, you, but that everyone's sort of signs, not really. That's the problem is that like people don't really sign it anymore. And when you break the contract, people don't really punish you the way they should. But it, it's what I mean is like, it's a contract that like, like what I mean is like, there, there's always this thing with, with uh, religious people. And I, I'm not religious. I'm not trying to denigrate anyone, but there's always this argument with Christians, at least in America, they say like morality is, ba- is you know, from a materialistic worldview, morality is meaningless. And I'm like, no, 
it's it's the same for Christians, has the exact same meaning for Christians as it has for me, someone who doesn't believe in God, which is that morality is the same as language. My morality only works when you share my morality to a large degree, right? If you don't know any of the words I'm saying, language is meaningless. Same with morality. Like, so apparently in, um, there's some tribe in Africa that spits on each other's feet as a sign of respect, you know, and that's completely normal to them. They just spit on, they'll spit, they'll spit on your feet if, if they think you're a cool guy, right? That's like insane to us, right? And it's like, it's no different. It's no different than the stuff we do, you know, maybe it's a little unhygienic or whatever, but well, shaking hands, maybe not very hygienic either, whatever. Mm. So it's just, that's just their system. Right. And so like you can have different systems. I'm sure there's a billion systems that work pretty close to as well as Western system. If we were going to, if we're even going to pretend that Western culture is that homogenous, which is not, but like, um, we have the problem. The problem is when we're both using different systems and we don't understand our each other's and we don't really even understand our own that well. And we don't know how to make that happen. Like that's an extremely different, difficult, like calculation to make those gears mesh when no one really understands. So, I mean, I don't know, maybe that's part of the problem. No. Is deep, more deeply understanding ourselves would help that would help that situation. Yeah. I, uh, Phil, as always, uh, I think I think <clears throat> car fill is unbelievably profound and philosophical. I also, I also think house fill is unbelievably <laughs> profound and philosophical. It's just different different angles. Um, so I think I think you're spot on, man. I, if it's like <clears throat> developing a moral vocabulary, um, is what I'm hearing you say, and like you, the degree to which you're committed to developing that will increase the probability of meshing with somebody else who maybe is committed to the same path. Um, Rob, what comes up for you when Phil brings up that topic? I mean, I think there's a lot of validity to it. I also think that it kind of dovetails into a lot of other conversations we've had on this podcast is like, if you have an honest conversation to find out how each other's, you know, what he would call system works. Like if your system is spitting on your feet is disrespect, but theirs is like, Hey, this means a lot. If you can bridge that gap by just talking, that'd be great. But sometimes I wonder if there is physiological things that could potentially void all these contracts because we are what we are based on our X and Y chromosomes. Um, I mean, not even to derail the conversation, but I've been wanting to ask you this personally, but since we're on the subject, if maybe we can table it for the next time we chat is like, for instance, when you're starting to date someone, you're talking about pair bonding versus competitive bonding. And I've really been actually kind of wanting to try that. And I've realized it's way more difficult to execute than you would think with that whole three month window of, you know, no sex with someone you're really trying to court. Yeah. But that's something that I would love to hear your take on because I've, I want to try to implement it to see if that's going to change potentially my luck with dating, not to make a total curveball, but I guess that's yeah. just something I thought, but with, with what Phil said, man, it's like, it's true, dude, everyone, like I'm not the most spiritual guy. And if you come across someone that is, I realize you're going to have to concede a lot more to them than they're going to concede to you if you're trying to find middle ground because they're so set in their ways and their values. And sometimes it's just like you're going to you're going to have to decide what's important to you. And, and a lot of times you're just going to have to agree to do what they want, even if it's not something you necessarily fully agree with for the sake of making it the relationship work. Right. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. Um, thank you guys for all of your perspective on this, because I think that the prerequisite to having a fundamentally sound relationship or business or healthy body, et cetera, I really do believe is oftentimes thoughtful inquiry via dialogue and monologue. I think it has to be both. Um, Ray, what's your final words of wisdom on this topic, buddy? Yeah, I think um, what Phil was saying uh, yeah. really fits in well with your agreements um, format, right? Where if my the language I use of morality is different from the language that you use for morality, well, then we're not, um, it's going to be hard for us to agree on what's moral and what's immoral conduct. So I think that, um, Wes, I think we should spend, we should dedicate a whole hour on the idea of agreements and like maybe you can walk us through how they've worked for you and how you've structured them. Because I think that is, uh, 
that's a place where like uh, the kind of the the inquiry and dialogue in advance can happen, um, and maybe kind of like uh, um, yeah, and then avoid some of the pitfalls or the uh, um, the kind of potholes that happen in so many relationships. Love it, Rob. Final words of wisdom, buddy. Um. I mean, honestly, I think that there's a lot that we can learn from you and like the social contract or with the relationship contract that, you know, at one point me and Amy kind of like teased you on. But now I realize, like you said, you're just for along in your journey. And I think those sort of social contracts should absolutely be discussed if you truly want to go for the win and make it work long term. Yeah, I, I agree with both of you. I think it's worth at least one session, maybe a few sessions on that in particular. Um, and it's nothing special about me. It's just when I adopted that, I, I just noticed my life started working a lot better. Um, even in business, right? Like Rob, like you and I have talked about operating agreements and the specificity inside of an operating agreement, mm -hmm. et cetera. It's just huge. It, yeah. It, you know, giving each other the respect of security, I think is an unbelievable way, positive way for humans to interact with one another. So yeah, we can dive really deep in that. Phil, uh, final perspective, buddy. Uh, I don't have anything else to say, but I guess um, understanding, yeah, I guess maybe the, I don't know, the same thing I said last time. I think, yeah, if people understood themselves more, they would understand uh, other people more. Cause I feel like that's one of the main, one of the main things causing a lot of problems with morality in, in America. Yeah, hell yeah, man. Arjuna, final words, brother. Um, yeah, to piggyback off of what Phil just said and kind of tie it into what the initial subject was, um, I think that the more fulfilled we are with ourselves, then the better, the less desire we need to stray away. And the more fulfilled we are with ourselves, the more we can find a partner who fulfills us in the way where those kind of thoughts or intentions don't even show up. Love it. Yeah. And for me, I'm walking away um from this conversation and phil thank you because you gave me a lot of value today of like g helping me tighten up my mental model and refine it um <clears throat> so one thing i would say to everybody listening is you know be really thoughtful about the others in your lives and as silly as this sounds and or as biblical as this sounds and by the way i'm i'm right like not heavily religious but the golden rule is a really important one, right? Like treat others how you would want to be treated or sell what would what you would buy on the other side. And in a topic that is so unbelievably profound as a, an intimate relationship, just be careful on, on, on reinventing the boundaries because it could le le leave you in a disastrous spot. And I'm not saying I disagree with open relationships or anything like that. I mean, I, I would never be able to do it just, just honestly. I just ask all of us men to also be honest with yourselves in that. You know, are you just seeking the hedonistic grass is greener on the other side because it's more convenient and it's easier? Or is there a legitimate argument for it? So just proceed with caution. And as always, you know, think through your own value systems, think through your agreements. And I love you guys. Thank you for this thoughtful discussion. Talk to you next week. Later. Later, bud. Thank you, gentlemen.